Welcome back. In this section, we are going a level up from the code to discuss the design principles. These are the principles that define how to structure your software that is used in different modules or components of the overall product. First question is why design principles? What are they used for? Design principles are nothing but the principles based upon which we should aim to design the software. Normally in any software we have the data structures, we have the functions and we have a few classes. These data structures, functions and classes, they interact with each other in different ways. Consider this diagram. In this diagram, small rectangular boxes are representing the data structures. Ovals are representing the functions and big rectangular boxes are representing the classes. As per this diagram, these data structures, classes and functions, they are just spread across multiple files haphazardly and they are interacting with each other on the need basis in a very unstructured manner. So clearly, these different pieces are not arranged properly and there is no policy that defines where to put which piece, what should go inside them and how these pieces are going to interact with each other. This is what happens when we develop a software in a very unstructured manner. We get some requirements, we develop something. Then we get a few new requirements and we change existing pieces. We add a few new pieces and the software just continues to grow. Slowly, the software becomes so complex, so hard to understand and maintain that we change only one piece of it and the ripple effect goes to the other extreme. Design principles are there to help us so that we do not fail in such kind of situations. They save us by designing the software so cleanly that we do not end up in this mess. Design principles are not the techniques of designing the software. Rather, they are the principles which we should take care of when we are designing our software product. Don't worry if it is not clear as of now. It will slowly become clear as we discuss these design principles. And we will see how they add value in designing the software. So far, I said that design principles help us in providing the structure to the software. But what is the structure of the software? When we say structure of the software, it involves multiple aspects. As we know that software consists of data structures, functions and classes, the structure defines how these species are defined, how they are arranged and how they interact. Design principles help us by getting to this structure by answering different important questions. For example, first question is what should go in a particular data structure or a class? We know that any data structure or class has certain member variables or attributes. But how to decide what attributes should go in one class or data structure? How to check if we have grouped them properly? How to decide when a class or data structure should be split? And the related question is related to the files or modules. In case you are not using object oriented programming, then you have a few data structures and related functions. In this case, how to decide which data structure and function should go in which file? Second question is related to the functionality. We know that functionality or features or the services that are provided by the software, it is done by using functions or methods. The question is how to decide which service or services should be provided by a particular function. How to decide if the function is too long or good enough? How to decide if this function should be split into multiple ones? Third question is related to the classes. Object-oriented design, it provides the tools 
using which we decide how the classes will interact with each other or will be derived from each other. Design principles help us in checking if we are using these relationships appropriately. It helps us in answering if we are doing too little or too much in a class. How to decide if a class should be split? How to check if the class is interacting properly with the other classes? Are the classes too tightly coupled or too loose? How maintainable or changeable a class is in the overall software? These are very important and subtle questions which we tend to ignore and they trouble us later. If our aim is to develop a software which has a long life, then it is better to address these questions as early as possible. Learning about the design principle is just that. Before we start discussing the design principles, let us discuss the problems these design principles try to address. Although we have already touched upon these. First challenge in any software is the understandability. Anything is understandable if it is simple. There is already a lot of complexity in this world including the software and including the requirements we get for developing the software. And the beauty is how simply we present the solution of these requirements. Be it the code, be it the software design or be it any product design. If it is simple, if it is easily explainable to others, it will be appreciated by everyone. I have personally seen many developers who come up with such complex algorithms that they themselves get lost if there is any slight change in the requirements or if they are asked a few questions here and there. Always remember that in the code or in the software, clarity is the king. Second challenge that these design principles address is maintainability. Any commercial software product is written once and it is maintained for years. Unless it is readable, understandable, it cannot be maintained. So clearly, understandability is required for maintainability. And the next aspect about maintainability is the changeability. How easily you can change a particular piece or component of your software that defines how easy is to maintain your software. If the components of the software are coupled very tightly, then you change one end and you never know what other functionality is broken. Design principles guide us how to make the software maintainable as we will learn in the upcoming chapters. Third challenge in the software design is reusability. Any organizations always look to improve productivity. And for productivity improvement, it is always good to develop the pieces or components of a software that can be reused in some other products very easily. In all our gadgets, we always look for accessories that are plug and play. We look for the apps on our mobiles which can be played very easily, isn't it? Software developers also look for the libraries or components that can be used very easily. Therefore, when we are developing the software, it is on us as well that we develop the components that can be reused by others very easily. Isn't it? In this section, we are going to discuss five design principles famously known as SOLID. These are Single Responsibility Principle, Open Closed Principle, Liskov Substitution Principle, Interface Segregation Principle and Dependency Inversion Principle. What these principles are, which problem area they address we will learn in the next chapters. Thank you. Welcome back. 
let's discuss the first design principle that is single responsibility principle in this chapter although we have already touched upon this the first question is what is srp or single responsibility principle as we discussed in the past if a function is doing multiple tasks then it should be split into multiple smaller ones where each one is focused on doing one task as shown in this diagram the left function is doing four task that is a b c and d in that case it needs to be broken down into four functions each focusing only on one task either of a b c or d this splitting of a function into multiple focused functions definitely leads to srp and we have understood the srp in this way only so far this understanding is good and if we adopt it definitely we will achieve compliance to the srp however this is not the exact definition of srp then what is the exact definition of srp and how our current understanding leads to the srp let's discuss next the correct definition of srp is as follows a module should be responsible to one and only one actor now let's understand this definition this definition talks about actor actor is nothing but a group of stakeholders who is asking for a change as we know there can be multiple stakeholders or users of a product and any change in the software is caused due to changes in the requirement from any group of stakeholders the actor word in the above definition refers to the group of stakeholders who are asking for the change now this change may impact multiple pieces of the software so the module word in the above definition referring to one such logical piece a module can be a class in the software or a group of related data structures plus functions it depends if we are using object oriented method of programming or functional one for this discussion purpose let us assume that the module is referring to a class therefore if a class has multiple reasons to change or in other words if it is serving different actors or stakeholders then it is violating the srp please note that as per the object oriented design we divide the complete functionality of the software into multiple classes whereas srp guides us to check if the classes we have selected they need to be modified or splitted further and this splitting helps us in multiple ways as we will see further first let's try to understand the srp definition with the help of an example let us consider a class in the software named employee this class has three methods do work report work and save work assume that these three methods are catering to three different users user a user b and user c respectively now assume that the methods do work and report work they use a common private method calculate work now let us say there is a change in the requirement from user a regarding the method do work and this impacts the function calculate work so the developer comes in makes the changes in the calculate work and tests the software from user a point of view and thereafter he commits the changes now since the changes in the calculate work was done as per the requirement from user a and user b did not ask for this change so he starts getting the problems and since the developer did not check the method calculate work was being used at other places also 
the software starts getting failures. Such problems appear and make the maintenance of software difficult because the SRP was not taken care of in the first place. Now let us discuss what should be the solution as per the SRP and how it takes care of such problems. Now since do work, report work and save work are serving to three different stakeholders, they should be divided into separate classes that is worker, reporter and saver. As now these are three separate classes, they are developed by three different development teams and they can use their own calculate work method because the design does not ask to assume or use a common procedure of work calculation. So in this case, the changes in the requirement from user A does not impact on other two classes. And additional benefit is that whenever one class is being changed, the testing team just needs to focus the test cases only for one stakeholder and not for others. Therefore, when we used SRP, it leads to smaller and focused classes. You may say that in this case, each class will have only one method. It is not exactly so. A class can have still multiple methods as long as they are related. One responsibility may also need to be served by multiple private methods. It may also require multiple public methods providing different kinds of interfaces for the same services. Finally, let us summarize the advantages of the SRP. First, as we saw with SRP, the software becomes very flexible and extensible. Since changing one class does not impact much in the overall software, therefore it becomes very much maintainable as well. And since the changes in one module or class limits the impact to a particular actor or group of stakeholders, the testing task becomes very easy. The changes in one class limits the test case execution for the use cases of the impacted actor only. Finally, as the coupling amongst the classes is less, they are loosely coupled. So the development of these classes can be given to different software development teams which can work in parallel. It leads to faster software development as well. So as you see, Adhering to just one design principle gives many benefits to the software development. That is all about SRP for now. Thank you for your time in this chapter. Welcome back. Let's discuss the next design principle, open closed principle in this chapter. What is open closed principle? This principle says that a software artifact should be open for extension but closed for modification. It means that once developed or finalized a software artifact, for example a class, it should be open for extension that is handling to the new or modified requirements but it should be closed for modification or change due to new or modified requirements. Let us try to understand it through an example. Let us assume there is a class, say vehicle. This class has one attribute that is number of cylinders and it has two methods. One is run and the second one is to calculate the mileage. Also assume that the method for calculating the mileage is based upon the number of cylinders. Now let us say this class is finalized and later we get a new requirement to add a new vehicle type that is sports vehicle. The calculation method in the sports vehicle for the mileage is different from the original class vehicle. If we have not followed the OCP open closed principle, then we will modify the original vehicle class as follows. 
what we will do is that we will add a new attribute in the vehicle class for the vehicle type and the mileage calculation method will change to cater to the new vehicle type right it seems simple but it will have multiple effects first is that the changes will require more testing effort all the use cases involving the vehicle class need to be retested now since this class has been modified second the new test cases for the new vehicle type will have to be added in the regression right so clearly there is more maintenance effort and third if you notice if we keep on adding the new functionality in the vehicle class for the new requirements then it will increase the size of the vehicle class and we are breaking the single responsibility principle as well now if we have followed the ocp then the design of the system would have been as follows in this case the original vehicle class is designed as an abstract class which includes an abstract method for calculating the mileage from this vehicle class we derive normal vehicle the definition of the mileage calculating function is provided by this particular class now in this case if we want to add a sports vehicle class then we simply need to have a new definition for the method of mileage calculation and now there is no need for attribute vehicle type the original and non impacted use cases will continue to referring to the normal vehicle and the new use cases or the impacted use cases will refer to the sports vehicle in this case since the vehicle and normal vehicle classes are not modified for the new requirements the scope of testing of new requirements will be limited to the sports vehicle class it will also reduce the chances of breakdown of software since the original software including the vehicle and normal vehicle is not getting changed that is how conforming to the open closed principle makes the maintenance of software easier with this thank you for your time in this chapter thank you welcome back in this chapter we will discuss the next design principle that is liskov substitution principle lsp lsp provides important guidance on how to use the inheritance in an object oriented design let's try to understand the lsp using a famous example of rectangle and square going by our intuition we know that every square is a rectangle in theory if you need time to think about this you can pause the video here and come back later however if we consider the implementation of rectangle and square in programming the picture changes let us assume that the rectangle provides two methods to set the height and width and along with that it also provides another method to calculate the area secondly the derived class square it provides one method to set the side of the square now let us switch to pie charm to understand further to save the time i have already written some code where the rectangle and square classes are defined as we see here the rectangle class is having two attributes height and width and three methods one is to set the height second one is to set the width and the third one is to calculate the area of rectangle in the square class the constructor is accepting one parameter side and it is setting the height and width attributes using this side parameter along with that it is having one method to set the side and in this method we set both the height and width equal to the given side right now let us come to the main program here we have defined one rectangle with the height and width as 3 and 
and because the height and width are 3 and 5 so the expected area of rectangle should be 3 into 5 and we are also printing the calculated area of rectangle using this method area defined in the rectangle class so let's try to run this program and we see here the expected area of rectangle is 15 as well as calculated area of rectangle is also 15 so so far so good now let us define a square with side 5 and calculate its area as well so here we have defined one square with the side 5 and we know that because the side is 5 so the area should be 25 so that is why we are saying expected area of square is 5 into 5 now let's try to run this program as well and here we see that the expected area of square is 25 calculated area of square is also there equal to 25 so it is working fine so far as well finally let's use the method set width to set the side to 3 in the square and then calculate its area now we have defined one square with side 5 and changing its width to 3 after defining it so by calling this method set width the width and height both should change to 3 that is why the expected area of square should be 9 and we are printing the calculated area of the square as well so now let's try to run this program and now we see here the expected area is 9 however the calculated area of the square is 15 it happened because when we set the width to 3 it only changed the width in the rectangle class actually and it did not change the height of the square because this method set width is coming from the rectangle class not the square class and in the rectangle class if we see the set width method it just changes the width attribute of the rectangle class the height remained 5 as it is and the width got changed to 3 that is why the calculated area of square is coming out to be 15 so here the behavior is not correct in order to correct the behavior of square we need to actually block the method set width and set height in the square class as they are not applicable in case of square it is because the attributes width and height they are not valid for square they are only valid for rectangle so what we need to do is something like this so here we basically need to block this set height and set width method in the square class we are just raising one not implemented error exception in both of these methods so as we see here the attributes and methods of the parent class are not applicable for the child class therefore the square class is not a correct derivation of rectangle it is not a correct example of inheritance for inheritance to be valid the lsp says that the method or behavior of the parent class should remain intact in case of child class objects now let us switch back to our explanation formally speaking the lsp provides the following guidance on using the inheritance first is that the new derived class should extend without replacing the functionality of old class that is the child class can extend the functionality of the old class it can have additional methods it can have new or enhanced implementation of the methods in the parent class but it cannot restrict the methods of the parent class second the derived class cannot throw any new exception if it does so then the clients using the parent classes will have to write a new code of handling new exceptions if they start using the child class objects using the parent class handle and this will break the transparency as now the client needs to be aware which kind of object it is dealing with and the third point is also talking about the same thing that the client should not be aware which specific type or derived object it is dealing with if all the above points are satisfied then only we should inherit 
even if the is a relationship is there between two classes. Now we are in a position to formally define the LSP, which says that if for each object O1 of type S, there is an object O2 of type T, such that for all programs defined in terms of T, the behavior of the program remains unchanged when O1 is substituted for O2, then S is the subtype of T. In other words, if T is a class and O2 is the object of it, and S is another class and O1 is object of it, and we can replace O2 by O1 without impacting the functionality of the program, that is, without the client being affected, then only we can consider the class S as subtype of class T. Then only there can be a case of inheritance relationship. In summary, LSP guides us how to use inheritance and helps us in avoiding the incorrect use of inheritance, where we end up in writing a code with so many ifs and the client will also have to struggle as they have to write the code with respect to which object they are dealing with. With this, thank you for your time in this chapter. Thank you. Welcome back. Now let's discuss the interface segregation principle in this chapter. Let us say we have an interface mic representing a microphone. It includes two methods. One is to record the audio and second one is to play the audio. Let us assume that this interface is implemented by a class my mic. Now there are two user classes, let us say user A and user B. The user A uses the method record from the mic interface and the user B uses the method play from this interface. Now let us say all this software is implemented in a compiled language, for example Java. So far, so good. Now let us say there is a change in the record method in the interface. In this case, the class myMic and interface mic will need to be recompiled. It is fine so far. However, since the interface mic is changing for the method record, the classes user A and user B will also need to be recompiled as they are using this interface mic by saying import mic, user A needs to be recompiled. It is okay since it is using the method record. But the compilation of the user B class is not necessary as it is only using the method play from this interface. This problem is happening because the interface segregation principle is not followed in this design. But wait, is it only a compilation issue? Had it been in a non-compiled language or scripted language, for example Python, will it not be an issue? It is an issue even in case of Python. Let us check out. Now here we are assuming the implementation in a scripted language, say Python. Python does not have any construct for interface. The interfaces are implemented using the abstract classes in case of Python. So here we have an abstract class for mic and it has two abstract methods record and play. Now let us say we implement a class new generation mic which implements this interface or in other words it inherits from the class mic and provides the implementation of the method record and play. It is ok so far. However, if we want to implement an old generation mic, which only provides the facility to record the audio, how can we do it using this interface or abstract class? That is the problem. The old generation mic cannot use this interface or abstract class. If it does so, then either it has to give the dummy 
implementation of this method play or raise some not implemented error exception in the play method and any of these option is not a good option to have. We are in this problem again because the interface aggregation principle is not followed in this design. If we follow the interface segregation principle, the picture will change a bit. Let us discuss that next. Now in case we follow the interface segregation principle, then we have two separated, two segregated interfaces for the record and play method, rather than the combined one. In this case, the new generation mic class can implement both of these interfaces, whereas the old generation mic just needs to implement only the recorder interface. Now the old generation mic class need not worry about implementing the play method as it does not implement the player interface anymore. Having the separated or segregated interfaces for the required method is the interface segregation principle. The interface segregation principle asks to keep the interfaces simple and segregated. If we follow this principle, it automatically enhances the reusability of the software. I hope that now the interface segregation principle is clear to you. With this, thank you for your time in this chapter. Thank you. Welcome back. Let us discuss the dependency inversion principle in this chapter. Consider this example. In this diagram, there is a service class which has some service data in it. Let us say it provides a method just to append some values in the service data. Now there is another class application which refers to this service class. That is, the object of application class has a reference to the object of service class. Now let us assume that the application class has a method app method and in the implementation of this method it refers to the service data of the service class. So app method is referring to the service data of service class. In our case the service class is the service provider and the application class is the service user. In other words Service class is the low level module and the application class is the high level module. Now let us see the implementation of these classes next. Here we have a service class which has the service data. In this example we have assumed that the service data is just a list of integers. The append data method is used to append a number to this particular service data. Next we have the application class which has the app method. In this app method, the application class is checking for the numbers in the service class and printing them if the number is greater than 20. Now coming to the main program. Here first we create an instance of service class and then we add some data in it. After that we create the application class with the reference to the service class object. Now if we notice in the app method, the application class is referring to the service data of the service class object. As of now this program works fine. The app method is able to find the numbers greater than 20 in the service class object. However, there is a big problem here. Suppose we change the implementation of the service class. Instead of storing the numbers into a list, we start using a dictionary or any other data storage here. If we do this, then there will be a clear impact on the implementation of app method as well, right? This problem is happening because the application class that is the high level module is dependent on the implementation of low level module that is service class. Such problems are avoided by the dependency inversion principle.
in case we follow the dependency inversion principle first we need to create an interface for the service needed by the application class that is the service user so first we create this interface for getting the service and this is the service interface as we see here this interface provides a service method which is required by the application class we are using the python example in case of python the interfaces are represented by abstract classes so the class service method is an abstract class with the abstract method service method now the class service needs to implement this interface and in case of python the class service needs to be derived from the service interface class so now we can see here the service class is deriving from service interface class and we can see that the service method is extracting the numbers greater than 20 and returning them earlier this functionality was being done in the application class here the same functionality has been transferred to the service method of service class since the service method is in the same class where the service data is this method can be easily modified if the service data implementation is changed from list to dictionary or any other data type next we have our application class now in the app method of application class here it just uses the service method of the service interface to fetch the required numbers instead of fetching them from the internal service data as long as the service class is implementing this interface service interface the application class need not worry about anything it will keep working fine now let us see the updated design as per the new implementation here as you see that the class application it refers to the service interface class the service interface class provides a method service method which is consumed in the app method of the application class this service method is implemented by the service class the low level module that is the service class now it needs to implement the interface service interface so this low level module is now dependent on this particular interface that is how we reverse the dependency and this is the dependency inversion principle dependency inversion principle says that a class should never refer to the concrete implementation of any other class for example service class in our earlier example rather the user class that is the application class should refer to the abstract interfaces and second we should not derive a class from any concrete implementation rather we should use inheritance in the interfaces in that case the implementation of child interface can refer to any implementation of the parent interface and third point is just the extension of second point only which states that we should not override the concrete functions if we do so then in the child class we have to import the non required libraries which were required in the implementation of the same method in the parent class so we were using some libraries in the parent class and if we are deriving from that concrete implementation of the parent class then in the child class method also we need to import the same libraries and that is how we invite the unintended dependencies right so in summary by following the dependency inversion principle we avoid the non intended dependencies to creep in our software and we keep our software clean we keep our code clean with this 
थैंक यू फॉर योर टाइम इन दिस चैप्टर थैंक यू